I'm Jose Gomez Marquez, um, and I run uh, the Little Devices Lab at MIT. This is the Maker Health uh, presentation. Um, I've never been to Dearborn or Detroit except passing through the airports. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, you guys know how to throw a good Maker Fair. Yeah, it's really good. Um, so what, I, what we do in the lab is mash up this notion of makers and health. Some of you have, may have seen some of our students and colleagues in the uh, Innovation Nation tent uh, back there. And, and uh, while I'm at it, I should thank uh, the Henry Ford um, and Innovation Nation. They, they really were responsible for getting us over here. We, we, we got an email from um, uh, the directors sometime in May. and. To be honest with you, I kind of blew it off because I was in the middle of the semester and it was one of those things where the email just went way down the list. And over the weekend, I, I was checking emails and I said, oh man, we missed this. I, and they just went to battle and made everything happen. So we really owe a big uh, thank you to, 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 to them. Um, so how many of you are makers or you consider yourselves makers? Okay, there's a handful of you. How many of you are in the healthcare field? How many of you are from the FDA? I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. Let me tell you a little bit about what we do. So, um, how many of you cook? I do not. So I pay a lot of attention to this. And you may have heard, may have heard me say this if, if, if we've met before, but I think cooking is I, I pay a lot of attention to this because it's one of those things where um, we have really scary tools that in any other lab environment, uh, the, the EHS or the safety officers would really uh, glare on you if you saw these uh, being handed out the way they do in a kitchen. We also have a really mature, have you been to like Williams and Sonoma? Like we have a really mature ecosystem of gadgets and technologies for cooking. Um, we, we, we use protocols that, again, under any other circumstance, if somebody saw us whip one of these out, they would think we're dangerous and crazy. You know, if you go to Louisiana, this is how they celebrate Thanksgiving. Uh, so it's one of these things where, like, but, you know, you, you don't even bat an eye. It's, it's, and, 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 and the wonderful thing about it is that we've also codified these protocols into ways that we can share. And, you know, I had an amazing dinner at, in Dearborn um, at a Lebanese restaurant um, uh, last night. And I'm sure that if the owner wanted to make a recipe book of, 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 her, of her food, um, she could publish it. And it would be something like, you know, Dearborn inspired Lebanese food and then translate it into French or Spanish. So, and it's one of these things where it, cooking just completely is transborder and transcultural. And we have really figured it out. We, it's, it's one of those methods in humanity that has been completely democratized. And so I pay a lot of attention to it. Um, the other one that I think is, 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 is democratized is, is the notion of when you go to Home Depot, you know, you have find people like her maybe painting the house for the first time um, or pros that know exactly, you know, they go out the back, they know exactly what they're doing. They, they, they lease those trucks and those tools for 48 hours and they get the job down. And, or people like me, who when they have a problem with the plumbing, um, I, instead of going like a you know, good plumber would down to the middle of the aisle and pick all the little parts, you know, I go to the end of the aisle, I pick the kit, and eight dollars later, I'm done. Um, if you go to a retirement home, you know, you, you'll find people making stuff. And you, if you'll, you see little kids here making stuff since they, you know, since they were months old. So I, as you all know, this is not news to you, but making is really in our DNA. Um, this is what I call making 1.0. I'm gonna go fast because this is, I'm preaching to the choir here. Those people in this room and the people behind us are the crazy people that I call making 2.0. This is what happens when, you know, um, we have some, we have a lab downstairs from my lab called Miters, and they, they make things that are cousins of these guys, or things like this, that then they find really enjoyable. Um, um, but but these, these individuals are also making things like scientific instruments that would otherwise cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they're launching things into outer space. 
And as you know, unlike the tinkerers of, of, of before, we now have a really strong community, all of you. And that's what I kind of call making 2.0. So how do we bring that into health? And to me, that's, that's sort of why we do what we do. You know, health, I think, is one of the uh, issues that whether we are healthy or not, it is still uh, everywhere. We spend more in health um, than many other fields. We've seen diseases that we thought were other people's diseases, like uh, come over to our borders and vice versa. Uh, you know, 15 years ago, nobody was thinking about diabetes in Central America, but when you have a country that goes, or, or India, for instance, but thanks to globalization, um, and you know, the the I, I still remember when there, the first Burger King franchise got launched in Honduras, and there was like a line out the door for five days, and you were cool if you went the first day. I was not that cool, but the the point is that the you know, diabetes is an issue now in these environments, and then um, this is. You know, now we, we see diseases that we would have otherwise not even thought about um, uh, hit 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 America. Last year, obviously, what happened in what happened in October of last year? If you were paying attention to the news, right? I mean, that was like a movie script, right? Like five years ago, and and so these diseases are things that we need to care about coming to our borders. So when we look at a lot of the work the work that we do internationally, now a lot more uh, domestically, a lot of the the places look kind of like this, figuratively and live. There, there is no infrastructure, and we we're facing roads like this. Um, but really, figuratively, there is no system, and a lot of the, what traditional international development likes to do is to build the system. And that's fine, but that takes a lot of time. And so at Little Devices, what we do is we say, you know what, we're going to deal with the system as it's given to us, and we're going to focus on designing that medical Land Rover to deal with that system. Somebody else will make that system mature, but in the meantime, we need, we need this. What happens when you don't do this is that you start donating medical devices. Um, and the statistics of WHO tell us that donated medical devices account for about 90% of all medical technology in the developing world. And within six months, 80% of it goes broken. This is a picture that we took, actually a colleague of mine took in, in Nicaragua um, about uh, 20 months ago in the back of a hospital. And what's interesting here is that all of these devices were designed by an engineer, a well-meaning one, okay? They were doing their job. They were FDA approved. They were UL certified. They were probably well-maintained up to a point. And they were donated to people they were never going to meet and with design constraints that were totally out of bounds from the original ones. And because, and I think this is the key for us, uh, the way we approach this, is because uh, there was this notion of, have you ever heard of the term design lock? Maybe some of the engineers in the room? This notion that once you have it, or did anybody see the Craggle movie? I'm sorry, the Lego movie? Do you remember the Craggle? Does everyone remember that? So we make these things, and then we put the craggle on it. The craggle, for those of you who have not, you see the Lego movie. It's a really good one. But um, the craggle movie, the craggle is basically this notion that you would basically now glue everything together so nothing moves and it stays in place. And when you do that, that means that the technologies don't bend to give way to the local constraints, but instead they break catastrophically as soon as they're used in a way that they're not supposed to or that they, they, they're trying to adapt. So we work with nurses, we work in environments like this in, 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 in hospitals in America, we look at home care, and we're trying to do projects around the world and really not necessarily export our solutions that we make at MIT to the world because frankly we're not that smart and these, these problems are hard. Um, but instead what we try to do is enable local makers in, uh, about, on how to solve their own problems. And the first thing that often happens when we talk about people making their own things is that there's this notion of, you know, you really shouldn't try this at home. Well, you know, you find people like this guy in China um, who made their own prosthetics um, because otherwise, he, sorry, not the prosthetics, that was another guy in China. Um, uh, you should look at that one. This, was, this, this guy um, got diagnosed with renal failure like seven, eight years ago. He couldn't afford dialysis, so he made his own dialysis machine from the parts that he was able to buy using that amazing supply chain that is the Chinese market. 
Um, so you say, okay, well, that's fine for China, but we're in Dearborn, Michigan. We, we have, you know, the Henry Ford, all these other, like, institutions around here. We, that, we don't, why would we do that? Um, let's go to a country like Switzerland. It's 1976, Switzerland, you know. This is a country that has more, like, they've made money in a national industry, right? So it's, it's not like we're, we're, we're hurting there. They have really good engineering schools, like EPFL and ETH Zurich. Um, but then there was this guy up in the right-hand corner, Andreas Grunzig. And Andreas Grunzig was an ra uh, interventional radiologist who wanted to use balloon catheters that at the time had only been used for um, basically your legs, and he wanted to use them in the heart. And for reasons unknown, um, and he passed away years ago, um, we don't know why he was just outside of the game. That, free, that person that just did not get the connection to the engineering school, did not get the right introduction. So instead of giving up, what he would do is from 11 p.m. at night to 3 a.m. in the morning, he would hack with his friends. This is his friend's wife, Maria Schlumpf, and at, that is his kitchen. You can see the pizza magnets in the back and the wine bottle and, 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 and parts of catheters that they would prototype to make what we now know today as balloon angioplasty. He got permission to try it on his first patient, had fantastic results, and immediately got scooped up by Emory University's program, and essentially created an industry that today is a regular old boring Medicare uh, reimbursed code in any hospital around America. It started in a kitchen table. This is another guy. This is um, Charles Dodder at Oregon. He would use guitar string wires and uh, Volkswagen brake cables to fashion his catheter. That's a hair loop catheter right there. And he went on to create a big medical device company called Cook Medical. And a lot of people, uh, sorry, and this is uh, John H. Gibbon, who in the 1940s basically made the first heart-lung machine uh, with a little bit of engineering help. But then he, was started, he started to basically give the blueprints away so other surgeons could, could make their own. A lot of people know the story about Earl Bakken because it's close to this area. Not really Minnesota, but um, Earl Bakken basically made the first wearable pacemaker in his brother-in-law's garage um, and then went on to become um, essentially Medtronic, which is one of the largest medical device companies in the world. So, so making has been with us in the past in health, and I think it deserves a spot so that it can come back and, and have, a, have a bigger role to play. And here's why. Um, this is the third law of technology by Arthur C. Clarke, and he said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So that means that if you are making cool gadgets, they should just be, inspire wonder and magic, and you, know, you may not know how they work, but they are just cool. And the problem with that is that when you go to a, your clinic or your hospital, you're surrounded by black boxes. Next time you use a machine at the hospital, think about it. Nobody tells you how it works. You're just supposed to trust it. And they aren't, they're not literally black. They're like off-white, beige, aqua, depending on the... But it's a problem because that means that you have no say in why is that $700? Why do I have to buy that disposable um, thing in, that shows up in my bill for $59? You, you, you just completely leveraged out of the equation. And biomedical engineering has learned one interesting trick, unlike all the other engineering fields, something that like people like Masi Bobansi, for instance, could never get away with, which is basically say, yeah, but we design for safety. And that little phrase has allowed people to stretch the price of things in our healthcare system beyond unimaginable um, costs. And I think that if more makers understand how these things work and how they can redesign them and, and basically answer back to the system, it's not that people are going to be making catheters necessarily in their kitchen tables and then inserting them, but you're going to have to have, you're going to be able to have a smarter conversation with the person trying to sell you these things um, and, and, and have some leverage in negotiation. This is an example of this. Um, we got a call from a Nicaraguan doctor once where we, we basically just, we were tooling around with these, um, this is a um, cauterizer pen, and we wrote a blog post on make, and basically they were like, you know, after a week, they die. We don't understand it. And what we did is Anna Young actually went to the material science department at MIT, uh, and we t we, first we took it apart. And I 
pen. Do you know what a live scribe pen is? So, so you know those like smart, I, I used a live scribe pen for, I thought I was gonna find like live scribe pen electronics inside this thing. And when I opened it up, it's about $15, I put basically, I mean, that's it. That's like 7-Eleven flashlight complexity. And they didn't even put the good batteries, you know? <laughs> like, like so, so we opened it up and, and, and then I thought, okay, maybe it's that little thing, um, I think this is a laser pointer. Maybe it's this little thing over here that's like a little piece of wire that glows. Maybe that's like some sort of fancy alloy that costs hundreds of dollars. Um, so Anna took, took it to the material science department. We talked to Mike Tarkanian, a friend of ours over there. He put it under some fancy microscope thing that I don't understand. I think it was a mass spec, but I'm not sure. And um, we found out what it was, and then he put it into another database. We found a roll of 100 feet on Amazon.com for $19. That's about maybe not even, you know, three-eighths of an inch. Of, of wire. So again, these, these are the things that, 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 that we don't really think about. Uh, uh, <laughs> it was a variant of tungsten. Um, I think it, it's in the blog post. Yeah. It's the batteries. It's all. <laughs> It's all, it's just the batteries. And because they were sealed, right? Think, so it's a sealed thing. You, you didn't, it, it wasn't like a flashlight where you unscrew it and replace the batteries. It was just the battery. They were designed for disposability. So they, on purpose, a limited. And you can say, come on, you can say, all right, well, let's, um, let, it's safety, right? We don't want them, you know, you, it, this ter okay, so they actually sell another model that's almost $30 where you can replace the tips. So come on, um, you know, we have challenges about who the innovator is and this is all part of this, this black box approach where we don't find who the innovators are at the hospital or, or where the innovations are perceived. Um, I remember um, watching, I'd never watch this show, I'll never watch it again, Grey's Anatomy. Uh, so the show, so we get a call, it's like, you're gonna love this, they're hacking things. And so we put on Hulu, we show, see the show, and it was about the plot is the Syrian doctors fly to Seattle and they need help learning how to like do war surgery and stuff. And so the Seattle doctors are showing the Syrian doctors how to hack milk bottles to like do bubble CPAPs for the anesthesia machine because that's what you do in Seattle all the time, right? Uh, and the Syrian doctors like, you know, taught the Seattle doctors about love. And I was like yelling at the TV. It was like, it's the other way around, you know? So. Um, and there is regulatory issues. You know, I joke about the FDA. The FDA funds half our work in diagnostics, actually. Uh, it's, it's a very tricky relationship with them. They know what we do with the DIY stuff, but it's something that they're gonna have to, they're grappling with right now. The moment, you know, people are making, or at least two years ago, people were, were, were thinking about what happens when you, you, you 3D print a gun or, um, or, or stuff like that. What happens when you 3D print a nebulizer? Um, uh, and, 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 and other devices that are much, much simpler. Um, the FDA is gonna have to grapple with it. I think that the first wave that they've already seen coming is um, the legislation they just passed in, in digital health. Um, the reality is they know that they may be able to regulate the apps that come into the Apple store and, 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 the, and the main um, app store in, in Google Play but they can't regulate an APK floating around the web, you know, on a BitTorrent file, or even just somebody just handing it to somebody else. And so they, they're, they're coming to terms with, a, with having a light touch on this sort of stuff. Another federal agency that, that has figured it out, that, that I find a lot of inspiration just around the corner is if you, I saw the Wright Flyer and, and, the, and the Henry Ford, I don't know if you knew, apparently has the entire Wright Brothers um, workshop over here. Um, is flying. The FAA has an entire agency dedicated to 51% build kit planes that by law have to be built by the user. Uh, and they, they have a mechanism to regulate them and make them safe, but also democratize this process so it's not just Boeing and Cessna making planes, but people in their garages. And then lastly, one of the challenges that, that, that I think is interesting is this notion of long tail um, challenges. We were talking to 
um, a mom outside in the in, in in the tent, and her daughter had a condition, and she said, "You know, the thing is, we're actually in this gray zone where um, it the problem is not big enough for people to make a product, but it's not easy enough for me to just solve. So it's we get stuck in the middle, and I." In a sense, I find that as a, I see that as a big opportunity that's different from the traditional medical device industrial complex. It's, it's this notion that as makers, we can respond to that. You know, there's a lot of N of one devices out there and they're all awesome. So how do we move that energy to make N of one devices for these patients? So these, these are some of the, I'm gonna skip some of these. These are some of the design strategies that we use in the lab. Um, we, we mash up things, um, you know, this is, a, this is actually at Berkeley Fletcher Lab. Um, the idea is you can take two devices that are generally not really, um, uh, that don't belong and you mash them up and it produces more than the sum of its parts. So when you, when you combine a microscope with a mobile phone, you don't just get a big mag magnifying glass on a mobile phone, you essentially get a distributed surveillance system because now there's like 3,000 people with this magnifying glass and they can all connect and they can see where the epidemic is going. You can look at old stuff. This is one of my favorite ones. It's look at old, I mean, I think you guys do it all the time. Whether it's old patents or books, I do a lot with old chemistry articles um, and combine them with new technologies. This is a, um, a doctor in Miami that got inspired and, and took you know, a syringe, which is one of the oldest medical devices, and, excuse me, um, combined it with his son's Nerf gun to make a terrifyingly painful device called the dragon gun that can shoot six um, injections in under a minute, which is very useful apparently in a trauma ward where he works in Miami. Um, context shifting. It's kind of like similar to hybridization, but it's where you just, you just apply the same device in a totally different mindset. I think back there, you see a lot of that. You see, you know, things being applied in places where it just doesn't make sense or is not normal, is, is completely orthogonal to a traditional way. We did it um, by following the example of the inventor of, oral po of the oral polio vaccine. He was actually in, in Mexico once, about almost 30 years ago now, 40 years ago, and they were on a vaccination campaign and they saw a crop duster pl uh, plane go by and he was like, wow, what if we could just do that and go home? Um, and, and, and a Mexican doctor called Jose Valdespino actually did exactly that, not with a plane, but with a nebulizer. And three million kids later, they were nebulized with the aerosol measles vaccine. Um, improvisation and design is something that we do a lot. Um, we look at how people in the field are already making their own devices and we learn from that. So I don't know if any of you recognize a device on the left. That is an the spacer for an inhaler. Most of you know what an inhaler is um, for asthma, but for little kids that have trouble breathing in, you also add this muffler looking thing that essentially slows down the, 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 the cloud of, 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 of medicine so that they can inhale it in several puffs. And it's like a $50 device. It's a piece of plastic, I know, but it's about $50 without insurance. So in Latin America, they wouldn't even think of using that. But what they do is they take a Coke bottle, they cut off the bottom of the bottle, and they ram it into the inhaler, and it works just as well. You can, you, there's been studies. You can look it up on PubMed, which is the NIH's repository. And, and it works great. So a team of engineers at Stanford saw this happening, got inspired, and said, we could do a little bit better, but that's a really good idea. And they made these origami looking spacers so that people would just print them out, fold them, and, and, and essentially you can see down here, it even has like the little face mask for it. I, um, I'm not pointing, like right there. Um, and then they print advertisement on the side and they make it a little bit more sustainable. So we spot a lot of these improvisations all the time uh, in, in our work. Um, I'm just gonna skip through these. These are some of the approaches that we take in terms of when I talk to people about what we call the drivers of the construction set or how we think about designing these things. And the first one, I'm gonna skip. You guys know what this is. We do think that nacre spaces are really interesting. Um, 
you know, there's there's lots of maker spaces all over the place. You, we guys have them here in, in, in Michigan and, and, and in the Midwest. Um, the area that I find really interesting is what I call the institutional maker space. Why does a, an institution like NASA have a maker space in Houston? Uh, why does the Army have the X labs? Why do we, you know, we're creating maker spaces in hospitals. And, and the, the interesting thing is it's not about creating that traditional skunk works, that special projects agency, that Area 51 anymore. As you, many of you know, makerspaces are about bringing everybody in. You can have the person at the front door come up with an idea and go use a laser cutter. It's not, doesn't have to be a senior engineer. Um, this is supply chain arbor. You know, when you look at your our supply chains, we, it's, they're really global, but some of them move faster than others. So a lot of our research is we spend a lot of time thinking, okay, what, what's available? What moves faster? Medicine, medical device uh, supply chains are notoriously slow. They have a lot of, because of import regulations and, and costs, but things like consumer electronics and toys and things like that, weapons, frankly, um, move much, much faster. And so we try to hack those supply chains and then use them in other areas. And there's, yes, computers and 3D printers. You guys know what that is. But one of the things that you may not, I, I, sometimes I, I, is, is kits. I think we, we have a lot of kits out there at the Maker Shed and other places. We find kits fascinating because they really lower the prototyping barriers. Um, and eventually you graduate out of these kits. But we have a lot of technologies that we use today, including the, app, the Apple computer was first shipped as a kit. A lot of people don't know the steam engine was shipped as a kit. And it allows people to really internalize um, the innards of, of, of a device. Um, so we make kits for, for, for medicine. Um, I'm gonna skip this for a second. This is a kit that Anna Young made. Um, this is the solar clave. Um, essentially, it's an autoclave that is powered by the sun. Um, and here's Anna putting it together. The one on the right is the MIT designed one. The one on the left is the Nicaraguan designed one. So I'm not sure what it says about our MIT mechanical engineering Europe's, uh, because as you can see, it's kind of like, you know, dangling precariously from from the chairs. These women that didn't complete ninth grade even made like a nifty little stand for ever and everything. Um, so the importance of working in the field with people, truly co-design it. Co-design for us is not putting up a bunch of post-it notes and getting people to put up ideas and say, what do you want so that we can go solve it? It's really about giving them the wrench. And if they don't know how to do the wrench, you know what, they'll spend an hour figuring out the wrench. But after that, they'll know exactly how the wrench works and what to do with it. Because otherwise, you interrupt them too much. You intimidate them. Um, notice that Anna, um, is not wearing an, a t-shirt. You, usually you see these pictures all over the world with like, you know, well-meaning technical institution, poor people, gadget, repeat, you know. Notice she's not wearing an MIT t-shirt. That's intentional. That's not accidental. Um, because what we found is the moment we wear, we, we, we wear an MIT t-shirt, it intimidates people because they think that we're from the Michigan Institute of Technology. They have no idea. <laughs> this is, this, I'm not even kidding. They, they literally say that. Um, they have no idea what MIT is, but they have a sense of institutionalism that we probably know all the good answers. And so we, try, we work very hard to let them know that we're just people like, like they are. Sadly, they know what Harvard is, so when I need the doors open somewhere, I just kind of say, yeah, we're from Harvard, and they let us in. Uh, <laughs> which is really sad. Um, so this is one of the solar clave models put together. Uh, talk about a medic kit. I ran into this, this, um, this nurse. Um, she was her, Daniela Urbina, and she, she hacked. A lot of people have heard me say that. Has anybody heard me say that? I just want to make sure. Okay, good. So basically, she's holding a stethoscope that she, it broke, and she took tape, and she basically, um, fixed it and, 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 and went around the, the hospital experimenting with different plas pieces of plastic and she settled on um, what, what, does anybody, this is an interesting experiment too, who knows what an overhead transparency is? Yeah, look at the little kids, they have like no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she settled on overhead transparency slides that they you'd use and if you notice, there's, it's still red from the Sharpies of whatever lesson that was. 
and it worked. And the tragedy of it was that it took me like two hours for me to get her to show me the gadget. And she didn't understand that there was a whole world of people like you out here that would totally want to see it immediately. They, you know, she'd be talking over here and show, or having a booth and showing her hack. And that was one of the first maker nurses. And so we started to do this, this, this project called um, uh, Medikit a few years ago, where we would essentially assemble construction sets so anybody can build their own devices. A lot of you saw these out there. If you haven't seen them, you can go check them out. These are basically nebulizers that you can make out of bicycle pumps. And we did do the science and got a publication out of it. And, and when, you, when, you, when you measure it, it actually follows. This is a, this is a performance curve um, against the FDA approved model uh, for standardization called the PAR ELC, and it tracks it. There's no performance uh, issues compared to, to the traditional one. And then we start showing nurses how to do it, and then they do interesting things. Not only do they learn how to do it, but then the nurse shows the doctor how to do it. Then the nurse gets really comfortable, they start hacking it, they make, they make it for, for children, and, and, and then they start sharing. Um, these are some of our early prototypes for uh, modular diagnostics. Um, this is an evolution. We first started with these, um, and um, when we, f I think many of you saw them outside. This is after about five years of, of iteration. When we first started, we made these things that this is about, I don't know, four inches long, three inches long, and people would be. They, they were putting them together into these like three feet long swords where you would need like, you know, a lot of blood to make it run. Um, and so we had to go back to the drawing board and, and really rethink the way the fluidics worked and, and this is what they, some, some, some of what they look like today. Um, we really hack devices and, and, and find new uses for them. Um, this is a device that many of, this is a vinyl cutter. Um, you can uh, buy the fancy ones or you can buy the cheap um, ones at Michael's. Uh, I think a company called um, Graftech makes some pretty decent ones or Craft Robo. Um, and those are about $200. And, and essentially it's a CNC with a knife, right? And you can, we can make microfluidic channels for, di for disease testing. This is actually a, a process formally called xerography by people that do that sort of stuff, but, but essentially zeros from the Greek knife. Um, and essentially we can make different patterns um, uh, of these things. Um, these are, if you don't, but you still need a computer. If you don't have a computer, we've made these molds so that you can actually mold the different channels. Um, I'm gonna just keep going here a little bit. This is, okay, I'm gonna show you, this is a nurse. Remember how we talked about supply chain arbitrage and using toys and stuff like that? A lot of people out, if you go back to the, to the, let me see if I can do this without help. Um, okay. Oh. It's, oh, it is there. Okay. So, I'm going to show you. We, we basically went to Nicaragua and we took a nurse to the, to the toy store and she said, I want to make an IV alarm. And... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this. We went to Nicaragua. We took some nurses to a toy store. And we said, OK, what do we want to build? And they picked out an AK-47 toy gun and said, we're going to build an alarm. And it's so cheesy. But, but that's the alarm. That's the gun. And that, that's, um, forget that. That's just Sanjay Gupta. Yeah, he ate a burrito in my office. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> um, so that's, he's sort of holding a, the, the prototype. But, Okay, it's gonna. I want to. I want to show you this. So, there it is. So there's there's the and it worked. And I'm gonna pause it. I recognize it looks like an IED. You know, it it looks totally hacked. You probably would never want this in your hospital room when you walk in. But who among you has had a beautiful prototype in version one? <laughs> Right? This is how it works. This is, this is the messy part of making and design. And this nurse had never even heard of the word design in her life 40 minutes before this. So for us, this is, it's not about making necessarily the final products at the beginning. It's, um, it's about democratizing these, these approaches. Um, let's go back to, okay.
Yeah. Yeah, so when it starts to get empty, it, it, it basically uh, creates a buzzer, and then if, they have, if they're looking out for you know, 20 patients, they can see which one, which one is, 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 is running low. So th there's a close-up of that. Um, these are microscopes we made um, with a diffuser um, so that we can scan um, um, uh, certain, certain microscopy slides for STDs. Um, you can buy this on Amazon on the right, the, the, the big gray thing that's just needle tiny microscopes. Um, you can see the microscope slide. Does anybody recognize what the, what the blue thing is? This is another generational test. Yes, thank you. It's a film canister. We get them for free at CVS now because it's a miracle we still get them. Um, but but it, it provides a nice diffusing um, source. Um, we started to play. This actually, this is a, this is a, some some things that we bought at Target and at the market, and we made what we call an agricultural prosthetic. Um, this started as a joke in a meeting, where somebody said, um, "What if we made like prosthetics that had functional attachments to it?" I mean, it was just we were just brainstorming, and then we mentioned it to one of the folks in 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 the car. They were like, "Oh yeah, absolutely. You, this would totally be useful because of the farmers and all." And so they 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 started to make stuff. Um, I'm gonna fast forward. I'm gonna show you one of the some of the work we're doing in diagnostics. Um, this is your traditional pregnancy test that you would buy at CVS. This is what we do with a concept called adherio. Um, and the notion here is that uh, we wanted to make diagnostics that can send a message. And um, in TB, adherence or taking, finishing your pills is a big problem. And so what we did is we figured out um, that the way they treat it around the world is something called DOTS, which is an acronym for somebody goes to your house, watches you take your pill, writes it down in a notebook, and then it comes back the next day. People get PhDs on the implementation of this at Harvard School of Public Health. Um, that's the gold standard. That's as best as we can do. Um, so what we did, they came to us with an interesting challenge. They said, those people that get trained to do this are not showing up to work, and so the patient it's like left in the lurk. And I'm from Honduras. And so it was really interesting because nobody was really saying this out loud. There was a couple of studies that were said, but these are the people we take pictures of in National Geographic and hail them as like pillars and angels of the community health world and all this stuff, but they're not showing up to work, they're just collecting the check. And that happens all the time in bureaucracies in the developing world. And I, that, we call them parachuters in Honduras because they just parachute at the end of the month to collect the check. And so that really got us bothered. And um, so what we, what we told them is, you know, there's your problem. You're, you're depending on somebody else. So we made something for the patient. And the way this works is, is um, we give the patient um, um, a diagnostic. The patient takes their pill. Um, and the diagnostic tests for the metabolites of the, meaning the, how, how your body processes the medication. Um, and gives you a color reaction. But it's not just like when you dip litmus paper on, in water and it changes color. In this case, it gives you a reaction in the form of numbers. So it actually gives you a secret code. If you don't have the, the pill in your system, you can't unlock the secret code. And so then you send me over SMS the secret code and then I reward you with cell phone minutes or Apple iTunes uh, gift certificates or whatever it is. And that way, I keep you both monitored at a distance and incented to finish your medication. Um, so we can do this. We use a laser cutter. Um, these are the little paper, this is a paper fluidic network. Um, and essentially, these are some of the details. This is some of the chemistry that we use. This was actually neat. The chemistry was neat. I did not invent the chemistry. We found it in like this 1972 journal um, it's called, originally it's called the Arkansas test. It was invented by a, a group of chemists and a nurse. The article was so old, there was no, I mean, there was no OCR on the PDF or anything. It was really hard to, to get. But you find some really good things when you look at old journals. Um, and lastly, one of the things I'm going to talk about is something we call Crowdio, which is, we're look, we, you know, we have systems for 
um, real-time um, uh, real traffic control, weather, but we don't really have systems for disease tracking. This is a, a, a really nice picture that the New York Times made of the cholera outbreak in, in Haiti. Um, none, of the, none of those pictures helped anybody because those were drawn six months after everybody died. So one of the things that we're working on with colleagues at, at, at Harvard Medical School is giving people individual diagnostics that they can self-report over the phone and can test for things like Ebola and, and dengue and chikungunya. Um, and we tried it already with water and, and gotten some interesting um, results. Um, so I think I'm going to stop right there and the, in, in for the sake of time and um, take any questions. I don't think I have. Um, pretty sure. I think it's there's some YouTubes out there that 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 have a lot of this stuff. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think um, that was a domain name decision. It's, it's just yeah. I didn't talk today about Maker Nurse. Uh, we have a whole booth out there. I think that's that might be interesting to some of you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, lots. Okay. Okay, I'll give you one. One, one the one that I think is just. I think we have an increasing digital divide in digital health. I think there's a lot of companies in Silicon Valley and we have a lot of friends in Silicon Valley and we love them and they're great. But there's a lot of solutions that are coming out of not just Silicon Valley, they're coming out of Boston and other places where we're trying to solve healthcare using apps and healthcare using Health enabled hard sorry, app enabled hardware. I am I have I own smartphones, I have an iPad, I, I, I do all that. But one of the things that I've noticed, and I'm s i am should have this slide somewhere, but I'll just we'll just talk about it, is has anybody seen this has anybody seen this video that is really cool? It's on Vimeo. It shows the progression of our office desktop and how the desktops got replaced, you know, the globe got replaced by Google Maps, you, are you with me? The, the typewriter got replaced by Word, et cetera, et cetera. And, then, and after a while, you only get your, your laptop and your pair of glasses, and that's all you need to operate in life. That's true, you need, a no, you need a notebook. Yes, that's a good point. So one of the things that bothers me is that if you think about the progression of those apps, is that they've made things a lot more affordable to her. I don't have to go and buy a $50 globe to find out where Bangladesh is or Ohio is, right? I don't have to. And, and so the reality is a lot more people have access to, that, to these tools. But when you look at the intersection of health, health hardware and apps, we're going in the wrong way. I bought last yesterday in the Dearborn Walmart uh, Thermoma, a digital thermometer for $2.95. There's a thermometer that you can plug into your Apple phone at the, and you buy it at the, at the Apple store, which is, I think, between you know, $29 and $35 because it auto, you, know, you plug it into the, the earphone jack and it auto logs your, your temperature. Um, there's um, another, anyways, there's like five of those thermometers. And again, it's, it's increasing. Um, and, and to answer your initial question, um, same thing with pill bottles, for instance, is my pet peeve right now. We're getting a lot of advertisements for, the adherence is a, like a $300 billion problem in, in America. And some people are going to be helped by pill bottles and smart pill bottles and things like mine and other things. I think there's plenty of ways that you can skin that cat. But selling people $300 smart pill bottles that are cloud connected, okay, to, for grandma, my grandmother's probably like on five medications. Um, I can't imagine that the solution in our healthcare system is to figure out how insurance can pay $1,500 for something you guys can build for your grandmother for about 30, okay? 
because you could probably figure out how to get the Arduino to connect to the Wi-Fi. I can't. Um, um, I would use the shield, the cell shield. But things, I think that the, the, the smart DIY pill bottles could be the things that we make for our grandparents, for instance. Um, I, I think that in, you can look at almost any of the other hardware. I mean, there, there's just tons. I, you just go look, go, go look at Kickstarter, and then when you, when you do the teardown, you realize there is a lot of money to be made, but also there's a lot of ripoff that's happening because people are just like, wow, it's, it's magic. Um, there's a lot of N01 solutions. Like, you, you know, uh, if you, the, the, the folks that do a lot of accessibility are already ahead of the curve, but they can, they, they, they still have a lot of, of needs. Um, and, then, and then lastly, I, I would um, pay a lot of attention, not so much with the stuff that we can do with motion sensors. I think that's saturated. I think we need to pay a lot more attention with the stuff that we can do um, with, with, with biological samples. Um, to me, that those are, you know, everybody likes to show that they can test glucose. There is a lot more stuff in your blood that you should be able to test uh, on a regular basis without having it cost hundreds of dollars. Um, I guess those are the, the, the ones that, that we pay attention to a lot. All right, so I think we're out of time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>